the United States believes 350 to 400,000 people remain in northern Gaza as the Israeli offensive uh, against uh, that part continued for another day. Uh, reports indicated from uh, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society, uh, for example, that all kinds of targets are being hit. An ambulance was hit outside Al Shifa Hospital, killing 15 people. Israel responded to these reports by saying the ambulance was being used by Hamas. Uh, hundreds of Palestinians continue to be killed uh, on a daily basis. The humanitarian crisis, as I was saying earlier, is worsening by the hour. Uh, the United Nations uh, relief agencies who are working on the ground are saying that aid is just not coming in, the kind of aid that is required. Uh, at the time of going into recording on Saturday, uh, no foreigners or injured people had crossed into Egypt from Gaza uh, at the Rafah border. Uh, that crossing also, that little small trickle of people that were being allowed to leave also apparently has come to a standstill. Uh, there's no end. Uh, there's no break or or, or such uh, in in the bombardment. Despite the presence of U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in the region, he's meeting with his counterparts, of course, Egypt, Jordan, as well as in Israel. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah uh, made a much anticipated speech that was watched keenly throughout the region and by analysts around the world, of course. Um, Abdul has been covering. Uh, for several days now, what is an increasingly desperate situation with very little good news. Uh, and he's with us again today. Let's go over to him for the latest on both fronts, what's happening on the humanitarian front as well as the diplomatic aspects. Abdul, thanks for joining us on uh, Daily Debrief once again. Um, if, uh, first up, as our first question has been to you all these days, uh, what is the latest? Well, uh... In last 24 hours, uh, of course, uh, Israeli aggression, Israeli airstrikes, as well as the ground offensive inside Gaza and inside the West Bank has continued as it was the situation before. Uh, in fact, there has been reports that uh, some of the schools which were kind of sheltering a large number of Palestinians displaced due to the earlier bombings in northern Gaza in particular, uh, has uh, have been targeted and uh, a scores of people have died, Palestinians have died there. Uh, one school in Jabalia. So Jabalia has been uh, under attack for uh, many times uh, uh, by the Israeli uh, aircrafts in the last week at least. This was the uh, fifth time uh, when Jabalia camp, a very densely populated Palestinian uh, uh, locality uh, has been uh, attacked again and again uh, by uh, by israel there has there have been reports that uh, even the hospitals uh, al sifa and al quds hospitals inside uh, the gaza strip have come under uh, uh, attack again so uh, this is uh, you can say there is a pattern that every few uh, days israel basically uh, uh, attacks uh, the hospitals the schools the shelters uh, and then tries to justify that uh, the, these uh, uh, these places were hiding quote unquote Hamas terrorists. So uh, and 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 in that uh, every time when the data came uh, comes out, when the real figures come out, when we see that most of the people who have died are either children or women, and that is a, that has been the uh, case in last uh, few weeks at least uh, consistently. So the Israeli offensive is about to uh, uh, complete a month uh, 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 soon. And, and in that around, as if uh, as per the reports so far, the, the overall uh, Palestinians who have been killed in the Israeli attack so far has crossed 10,000 uh, mark. Uh, as for the latest figure, it was around 900, uh, 9,900 some uh, figures were there given a few hours back. And of course, because the bombing continues, yeah. uh, that figure has uh, uh, crossed 10,000 for sure. Uh, apart from the uh, what is happening in Gaza uh, 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 Strip, when it comes to Israeli attacks on it, there are also reports from a massive uh, continuous raids on Jenin, in particular in the occupied West Bank. And there have been other uh, localities, pal uh, Palestinian locality, uh, localities in the occupied West Bank, which have come under uh, uh, attack by the Israeli occupation forces. And there also the overall death toll has crossed uh, uh, 150 
uh, uh, since October uh, uh, 7. Apart from the people who have been killed, around 2,000 Palestinians have been also arrested mm. uh, by the Israeli occupation forces from uh, the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. And there have been, uh, if we just uh, count the number of people who have been injured, uh, a very small number has been able to move out uh, through the Rafah border in the last few days, around uh, which is not even crossing 1,000 people. Uh, the majority of around 20,000 plus people who have been injured in the Israeli um, attacks uh, uh, since October 7 are still uh, in, uh, trapped inside the occupied uh, Gaza in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Abdul, uh, we're also seeing reports of strikes targeting, uh, you know, places that you would consider part of daily life. So not even sort of in that sense, uh, anything to do with... Uh, state functioning or that kind exactly. of mega infrastructure, fishing ports, for example, restaurants. Uh, uh, which, Bakeries, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, of course, places of worship have been uh, targeted, but also things like, uh, you know, solar panels that are providing yeah. this kind of uh, power supply to, uh, you know, ease the situation where fuel is desperately short as well. Uh, all of these things compounding the kind of uh, already total siege that, that is going on. Exactly. Uh, in fact, that it's, it has been uh, Israeli strategy, part of Israel's strategy inside Gaza in particular, to uh, target uh, uh, civilian infrastructure deliberately to make uh, the life difficult for uh, Palestinians there, around 2.3 million Palestinians there, as difficult as possible. And uh, uh, the blockade, which was imposed on the food and fuel and other medical supplies even, including medical supplies on October 9th, has basically continued despite repeated uh, appeals uh, uh, given by the United Nations, given by the Red Cross societies, uh, Red Crescent societies working there, and the other uh, uh, groups which are trying to help uh, people who are trapped uh, under debris, people who are injured, and, and that number is quite huge. So there are reports of uh, even the ambulances being targeted. Uh, in fact, one, the, one of the ambulances uh, which were targeted uh, on, uh, on Friday, uh, there were dozens of people in and around that ambulance, including the people inside the ambulance uh, were killed. Uh, the overall humanitarian, that brings us to the uh, overall humanitarian situation uh, inside the Gaza Strip. Because the uh, the, the so-called uh, humanitarian supplies have been very slow to reach uh, because of the restrictions imposed by uh, Israelis on the Rafah border, uh, because of the bombings, because of the lack of fuel, which basically also hampers the transportation of whatever material reaches uh, these territories, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the repeated attacks on uh, hospitals and so on and so forth, uh, it seems that the majority of the Palestinians uh, inside Gaza uh, have been uh, completely deprived of any kind of uh, basic humanitarian assistance which they need. As a majority of the patients or, or the people who are injured are treated uh, in hospitals which uh, uh, do not have adequate supplies of uh, medicines, of doctors, of, e uh, of infant beds. So people are uh, being treated on the floor and so on and so forth uh, in whatever way, uh, way possible. Uh, so, yeah, so that is, of course, uh, uh, it seems that it's a part of uh, Israel's attempt to uh, kind of uh, uh, what some uh, some of the activists have called uh, attempt to ethnically clean uh, uh, palace, uh, uh, Gaza, uh, that uh, uh, Gaza territory from the Palestinians uh, 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 and kind of create a kind of what they think uh, a buffer zone uh, inside that territory. And for that, they are basically trying to demoralize the Palestinians as much as possible, kind of uh, make them uh, feel that they are not secure anywhere. And yeah. uh, uh, with, of course, the ultimate objective to force them to leave the territory. Uh, Abdul, since we last had a chance to speak uh, here on Daily Debrief, uh, Hassan Nasrallah has made a speech, uh, the leader of Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, it was closely watched and, and you know, various analysts, depending on what perspective uh, you're looking at it from, had various things to say before, of course, as, as well as after. Uh, how do you uh, look at the speech and how it was received? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the speech uh, 
some of as you rightly pointed out some of the uh, analysts uh, were expecting some kind of big announcement uh, uh, kind of declaration of war against uh, israelis and so on and so forth mm. which um, if we if we follow hezbollah closely uh, has not been their strategy to do so they never uh, kind of go all out and kind of announce uh, uh, an over, uh, all out war against uh, uh, israel has never done that uh, in the past and of course that's exactly what hasan nasrallah did but he, he his message was quite clear uh, he 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 basically said that uh, what is happening inside uh, palestinian territories is basically a result of the us uh, uh, unconditional support and involvement in the israeli uh, uh, massacre inside uh, uh, gaza and other palestinian territories and therefore if us want uh, uh, such uh, uh, that any escalation of the war uh, uh, it becoming a regional war then it has to basically do something and uh, make israel stop uh, 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 from uh, carrying out the genocide inside gaza that's exactly what hasan nasrallah said if after uh, his speech he uh, uh, there uh, there there have been reports that Leban, uh, hezbollah has fired much more uh, uh, intensively inside the uh, israeli territories in the last 24 hours mm -hmm. and there are uh, um, of course counter strikes uh, carried out by the israeli forces yeah. inside lebanon this is happening at a time when blinken is again uh, in the region uh, trying to uh, give a message that uh, the uh, quote unquote the threats from uh, uh, threat of uh, war in palestine becoming a regional war has been neutralized because hezbollah is pacified or at least hezbollah's threat has been deterred mm. of course that is uh, i think is a, a misreading of the situation and what nasrallah was saying is a clear indication that if uh, something is not done uh, to stop the war in gaza uh, no nothing uh, can prevent it uh, uh, from becoming a regional uh, war so um, but in that context one if you if we look uh, the overall uh, situation uh, mm. uh, 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 about international uh, diplomacy what yeah. is the condition of international diplomacy on the gaza uh, so far uh, of course uh, we have seen in the previous uh, uh, weeks that despite the attempts made in the un security council and uh, in other places uh, uh, despite the appeals given by some of the security council members permanent members like china and russia uh, Israel has not bothered to uh, 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 kind of uh, listen to what whatever uh, these uh, kind of appeals were made, mm. and uh, uh, and that that situation that status quo continues despite the fact that there are much more much despite the fact that there are many countries uh, at this moment who have basically the number of countries who have severed their diplomatic ties with Israel mm. has increased. This in, uh, this includes apart from the Latin American countries like uh, Bolivia and Honduras. Honduras mm -hmm. being the latest, that one of the countries which basically severed its uh, diplomatic relationship with Israel was Bahrain. Bahrain, one should remember, was one of the first countries, Arab countries, uh, which signed the Abraham Accord, the so-called yeah. normalization deal with Israel in 2020 under the U.S. Uh, uh, pressures. And it was considered to be a big achievement for the Israeli diplom diplomacy, mm. and so on and so forth. So, if there are, uh, if the 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 clear message is, if the situation in Palestine continues, and if Israel refuses to listen to uh, 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 the appeals made by the uh, world community, the, uh, if there will be greater number of countries. Uh, uh, who will basically take such steps to in take, the coming yeah, days? Progressively. They will be forced to take. In fact, Turkey's uh, president Erdogan has clearly stated that they, uh, they don't see any more uh, Netanyahu as a kind of a partner uh, uh, or a person whom with whom we can have even a civilized talk. So mm -hmm. these kind of statements are indications that the the patience. Which uh, with which the Arab countries or the neighboring countries in the uh, 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 the countries in the region yeah. have basically, which they have shown in the last few weeks, is basically gradually Not becoming uh, uh, primarily because of the popular pressures created by the people who have marched to the streets have demanded, forcing their governments to take certain uh, urgent steps 
to help the Palestinians. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul, for bringing us uh, up to speed with the latest uh, developments, both uh, in Gaza, of course, and what's happening on the diplomatic front. And our second and final bit for the day is on uh, the visit, as we had reported a few days ago, uh, of Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to the Philippines, where, among other things, he became the first Japanese Prime Minister to address a joint session of both houses of the Philippine Congress. Uh, among the discussions, the most uh, talked about is a potential security deal, a defense deal, a military deal between two countries that will allow for visiting forces to access each other's facilities. Uh, what does this mean for the region? Of course, Anish is with us. He gave us a primer as well a couple of days ago. Uh, we, we have him again uh, to, to sort of get a sense of what actually went on uh, when Kishida visited Manila. Uh, Anish, we had the chance to do a bit of a primer on this visit uh, a few days ago. Now, now that it's on and happening, uh, and indicators are that this uh, deal, at least discussions on it, will move forward in terms of you know the visiting forces agreement. Uh, how significantly do you view these developments in the context of what's going on in the region? Well, as we have spoken about uh, before uh, in the show as well, uh, this is actually just an indication of how uh, significantly Philippines is shifting back uh, to the U.S. Uh, pole of access uh, mm -hmm. in the region right now, and you know, basically uh, executing uh, a lot of uh, U.S. pro-U.S. policies uh, into its foreign policy uh, matters at the moment, and so this is a very peculiar situation where uh, you have uh, a country where. Obviously, you can't have permanent military bases of other countries, but you can have deals in a manner that gives access to, uh, you know, existing uh, Filipino military bases. And so U.S. already has that sort of uh, uh, situation, a sort of agreement that uh, which is called the Visiting Forces Agreement. And that pretty much allows it to make use of uh, a lot of uh, Filipino armies and navies, military bases. And very recently, we spoke about how a lot of these bases uh, and this access was actually expanded to include areas that is that are closer to you know the disputed territory that Philippines has with China in the South China Sea, and also uh, closer to uh, Taiwan in the Luzon uh, in the north of Philippines. So very clearly, there is uh, a very similar attempt because we have seen uh, with the statements that Kishida has made. Uh, in the current, uh, you know, visit that he has had uh, in the Philippines, in Manila, where he spoke about how the attempt is to coordinate with U.S. and Philippines to deal with uh, the situation in South China. See, he does not really mention China, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very clear who the, uh, you know, the target is in, uh, in this round of, uh, you know, diplomatic action. Uh, and uh, and it's quite interesting also because Japan, unlike other uh, unlike Philippines, does not have any stakes in the South China Sea, does not have any claims as such. In fact, it has a very imperialistic history in the region and also in the Philippines as well. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is becoming uh, like uh, com uh, combined with Japan's attempt to move away from its pacifist uh, constitution and its pacifist past. Uh, it is pretty much in line with both of these governments, uh, you know, a very reactionary, very warmongering kind of, very confrontational sort of uh, uh, tendency against China. And that is that is actually creating a sort of uh, situation where you will, you can actually draw a clear line of who, uh, uh, you know, who wants to confront China and who doesn't want to at this point in time. And this, uh, you know, the sharper this line gets, it's going to create more tensions in the region as well. Uh, Anish, in the uh, context of uh, Japan, uh, you, you were mentioning, uh, you know, going back on the pacifist aspects that are at the core of its uh, being as such. Uh, but, uh, and, and Kishida has, I mean, this process has been going on. We've discussed it often on, on Daily TV. Um, as well. Uh, is it now looking to use, uh, I mean, we, we always know or uh, there are many instances of Japan lending capital uh, as a tool of its foreign policy, uh, but some of that now also being tailored through security arrangements and security assistance, the sort of networks that are being created. Uh, is that also part of 
uh, Japan's kind of policy going forward? Going. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the current set of agreements that have been signed in Manila, uh, it, with, especially with focus on tourism, uh, it's quite clear. And uh, all over the next five years, it's quite clear Japan is obviously trying to use, uh, you know, investments and capital to, and also maybe aid in some ways. Maybe uh, maybe not in the case of Philippines, but also definitely in case of other countries as a way to project its influence. Uh, and it's not just uh, in the East Asian or Southeast Asian region, but across Asia, that has been pretty much the case with Japan, mm. uh, especially uh, vis-a-vis trying to compete with uh, the influence or uh, you know the goodwill that China has uh, in Asia as well. So that is definitely there. Uh, but uh, obviously at the current moment, you see uh, there being a heavy attempt like an attempt to heavily invest in militarization and obviously a large part of that will definitely go into creating deals with neighbor neighboring countries uh, with governments uh, that that are aligned to its foreign policy uh, rather than and create a network of you know military presence in the region uh, which should i you know ideally alarm mm. uh, you know uh, the people in the region uh, and it does, it actually does alarm a lot of people. Many progressives have spoken against such moves and maneuvers. And obviously Japan's attempt to exert its military strength in the region, uh, mm-hmm. because obviously there's a very, you know, gory and you know bloody past uh, that is behind uh, when, whenever Japan tried to militarize itself in the region. Yeah. Uh, but that aside, uh, this is definitely uh, going to be part of the focus right now with its relationships. And that clearly also indicates a break from the past. Like even with Shinzo Abe, who was usually seen as a more far, uh, more right wing mm. among the pr- previous prime minister, Kishida has actually taken Japan uh, a step, a couple of mm. steps forward, actually, in uh, towards the sort of right wing tilt, uh, mm. sort of uh, militarization tilt that no other prime ministers uh, either tried but failed. But uh, generally, uh, Kishida is far more successful in that respect. And that has made, uh, and that is really going to create concerns for everybody uh, in the region as well, because uh, any kind of militarization or competitive militarization definitely is going to have its own impact in how, uh, you know, it's a con- it's a region that does not have conflict uh, or armed conflict for, you know, more than half a century, actually. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about East Asia. Mm. Uh, the fact that, but there are still, you know, simmering disputes there in the region that have not been resolved and the fact that japan is uh, doubling down on these disputes and you know also adding to some of the other tensions like mm. in the korean peninsula it is going to create a situation where uh, you know tensions are going to be the new normal in east asia and it is already becoming the new normal we are already when we talk about the region we are usually talking about the tensions and that is really the yeah. most concerning part at the moment to anish thanks very much uh, for bringing us that update today. And that's all we have on this episode of Daily Debrief uh, from Anish, myself, and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll be back next week with more uh, of the news, of course, and also uh, beyond the headlines, the real stories, uh, bringing those to you on peoplesdispatch.org uh, as well. So head over there for details on all of the work that we do. Uh, don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. Until Monday. Bye.